Hello, Keith Kaiser here again. We are studying the book of Acts slowly uh, with great intentionality. We're paying careful attention to what the word says here and going verse by verse in a systematic way. And we come back to Acts 17 today. Again, we read at verse 5, But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from, from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now there's a veneer of legality here that they carry the Christians off to the authorities and they protest against them. They lodge a legal complaint and say that these people here are fomenting rebellion. They're saying there's another king, Jesus. And of course, we can ask ourselves, does the Bible say indeed that the Lord Jesus is a king? Well, certainly it does. The Gospel of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, certainly looks at the Lord Jesus from that vantage point. In fact, all four Gospels present his kingly credentials, though Matthew especially emphasizes the kingdom of heaven and that the Lord Jesus is the king. Not just the king of the Jews, but he's going to come back and reign over the world as king of kings and lord of lords. But in saying that, he was not a danger to earthly and temporal rulers. This is the age when God is letting the world go in the way it is going, and he's reaching out with the gospel. And the Lord Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, having come and proclaimed peace and proclaimed the way to be right with God, the Lord Jesus, after dying on the cross to open the way of salvation, to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin and to pay the debt we owed, that sin debt, the Lord rose again from the dead to vindicate his own claims and show that he can save whoever believes on him. And the Lord, after showing himself alive by many infallible proofs uh, for 40 days, the Bible says, ascended back to heaven. And the Lord has now sent his Holy Spirit into the world, and he's witnessing to men of the resurrection of Christ, the truth of who he is, and his saving power. And it's true, the Lord Jesus is going to come again, and every knee is going to have to bow to him. Every tongue confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. That includes earthly rulers, because it says, of things on earth. And so they're going to have to bow the knee to Christ and his government will be set up as Christians pray in the language of the model prayer he taught us in Matthew 6. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It shall be done. It shall come. The Lord will come and rule and reign exactly as the Bible promises. Not just the New Testament, but we have many prophecies of the Old Testament picturing the Lord Jesus coming to rule and reign over the earth and it will be a wonderful thing when he does because righteousness shall reign and evil will be subdued under him and eventually he'll bring in something even better the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness after he has ruled for a thousand years from Jerusalem on the throne of David but at this current moment in the church age the Lord is not a revolutionary. He's not a heavenly Fidel Castro or Che Guevara or name your revolutionary. He didn't come to upset the earthly governors and kings. In fact, the Bible is quite clear that the Lord ordains the powers that be. Romans 13 would teach that. 1 Peter 2, which was written in the context of the awful and persecuting reign of Nero Caesar, would say, love the brotherhood, honor the king. In 1 Timothy 2, we are taught to pray for rulers and for all who are in authority because God wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So we can pray for President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Boris Johnson and whomever the next Prime Minister of the UK is and all the different leaders of the world. We should pray for their salvation. Some probably know the Lord already, especially in some of the smaller countries of the developing world. There are certainly some presidents and prime ministers that would profess 
the name of Jesus Christ and say that he's their Lord and Savior. But even those who aren't, we should pray that they'd come to know the Savior. And we are to pay our taxes, as our Lord said in Matthew 22, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And we are to try to live a quiet and peaceable life. That's what we're praying for, according to 1 Timothy 2. We're to be, in that sense, good citizens. Not subversive and dangerous people. Not people that are violent and seeking to overthrow the existing regime. You can look at the different movements that are around today, many of the isms, and uh, they're trying to overthrow all kinds of things. They're trying to overthrow the existing political system, or they're trying to overthrow existing philosophical notions of what the world should be like. And even the ideas that are put forth by biology and that have been acknowledged for millennium, that there are such things as men and women, male and female, what the Bible teaches, that God created us male and female, an indispensable combination that collectively entails humanity, that makes us man. God created man in his image, Genesis 1 says. In the, uh, he says he created them male and female. And so neither is dispensable, neither is of no value. The Lord Jesus was given for the sake of the sins of the world. The Lord Jesus was given to save mankind if they would have him. And the Lord, therefore, hasn't come to destroy us or destroy uh, anything that's good. The Lord has come to put us right, to put us under the authority of our creator, even the almighty God, who made all things through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what his spirit is bearing witness to by the word today, the truth of Christ. But the accusation goes out that they have taught things and are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. When in, in fact that wasn't the case, that there was a measure of religious freedom in the Roman Empire and there were certain religions that were considered legal, of which Judaism was one. And at this stage in history, the Romans thought that Christianity was just sort of an internecine squabble among Jewish people. In other words, this is some kind of internal discussion among the Jews, and it wasn't really a separate and distinct religion or belief system. So they weren't doing anything that was contrary to legitimate law. And indeed, that's the teaching of God's word. First Peter would tell us that if any man is a Christian, let him not suffer as an evildoer. If you suffer for your faults and take it patiently, says Peter, what profit is that? That doesn't advance the cause of Christ one bit. You're just getting what you deserve if you're being punished for your faults, for the things you've done wrong. But if we suffer for righteousness, even as our Lord, Christ once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, is what First Peter 3 tells us. And so uh, we're not to be rabble rousers or revolutionaries or people that are kicking against uh, the world order, as it were, the way we oppose is by truth. And we proclaim the truth and persuade people to be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors, as Second Corinthians 5 would teach, that we exhort people in God's stead to be reconciled to God. Get right with God is the thought there, that we're brought back into a state of harmony and peace where we submit to God's authority and enjoy his blessing and his love. And the only way that can be done is if something is done about our sins. You say, well, what can be done about our sins? I can't change history, can't change the bad things I've done or thought or said in the past. And that's true. Neither can I. In fact, I can't stop myself from sinning in my own power. I don't have the capacity as a fallen human being to do that. I'm broken and damaged by sin. And so are you. But the Lord Jesus is the Savior. The Lord Jesus is the one through whom we can overcome. We overcome by our faith that Jesus is the Son of God, First John 5 says. That's the faith that overcomes the world. And he makes us overcomers, and he can strengthen us by his Spirit through the Word of God to resist temptation, that when it comes, we can flee from youthful lusts, even as Joseph did in his time, that he ran away from the temptation. He lost his garment, and in a sense, his reputation for a time at least, but he kept 
his standing and his uh, testimony before God, we might say. And so they weren't doing anything wrong, though that accusation is made against them, much like earlier in Acts we've seen Paul and Barnabas accused of being doing things contrary to the Romans, and we saw it again uh, earlier in Acts 16 with Paul and Silas at Philippi, that they were accused falsely of breaking Roman laws. And so uh, it was a common rejoinder or complaint of the enemies of the gospel in the ancient world that the Christians were doing things that are wrong. And of course, in later centuries, Christians would be accused of having orgies uh, because they would talk about loving one another and they would talk about love feasts and people assumed the worst and they put the most perverse kind of cast upon those words and they thought Christians lived just like everybody else. And they accused them of being drunkards and hedonists and accused them of being cannibals eating human flesh because they knew about John 6 where the Lord metaphorically spoke of himself as the bread of life and said, you know, here the humans are actually eating his flesh. And they thought that they were kidnapping people and babies and such and eating them. All these false and spurious and nasty charges. And in some parts of the world today, still, Christians are the doormat in their communities. And they're accused of all sorts of awful things, from everything from being described as unpatriotic to being described as immoral and dangerous and so they're persecuted and of course there are many groups in our world today that suffer uh, there's no monopoly on suffering because to live in this world is to be affected by what sinful man does so man hates his fellow man and other religious groups will suffer but no group is blamed and scapegoated like the christians and it's funny that uh, when people are persecuted in other religions, often our Western secular media will leap to their defense and talk about human rights and freedom of religion, but they utterly pass by in silence the many instances of believers that are persecuted around the world for their faith. Now, in the United States and Canada and even in the UK, very little physical persecution compared to the rest of the world. But in North Africa, in the Sahel, in the Middle East, in Asia, there are many countries where it's considered sport to pick on and assault the Christians. And in a number of cases, the authorities do nothing about that. And even when they complain where their rights have been violated and laws have been broken, the judges and magistrates and police forces and whatnot won't protect them. Well, we shouldn't be surprised by this. The more things change, the more they stay the same, as the old saying goes. And our Lord told us that would be what would happen to Christians, that those who followed him, even as he was persecuted and rejected, so would we be also. And in fact, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's not the abnormal state. It's more what we might call, to take a page out of Watchman Nee's title, the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is to suffer for Christ's sake in this world because the best thing the world ever gave him was a cross. And if we're going to follow him, we have to take up our cross and deny ourselves. And we do that on a daily basis. Every day we realize this world's not our home. This world isn't going to love us. This world hated him. And so it will hate us. And yet we're going to love the Lord and serve the Lord and testify for the Lord as long as he leaves us here until he takes us to himself. And someday, though we might be in a prison cell, though we might be under attack or in hiding, the Lord will come and deliver us from all this because our destiny is heaven. Our destiny is glory. That he said, I will come again and re receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, as he promised the church and told the apostles in John 14. And so the rulers here, when they heard these things, it says, they took security from Jason and the rest and let them go. And we'd say today, they got out on bail. You know, they set the bail, the bail was posted, and they released the prisoners. And it all has this sort of facade of legality and proper jurisprudence. But this is, in actual fact, a lynch mob uh, that has set the legal authorities upon innocent people, and the authorities 
are afraid to stand up to the mob and do the right thing. And they've uh, let these Christians go and uh, they've nevertheless sort of held over their head that there's some accusation against them. And so people might look at the Christians and think, well, maybe they really are bad. And yet the Holy Spirit is showing us in the book of Acts, no, they're suffering through no fault of their own. This isn't about rebellion and opposition to Rome. This is about standing for Christ. And that's why these folks were arrested. And that's why uh, the gospel is persecuted wherever it goes. May God help us to stand in these evil days, if you know the Lord Jesus, that we would be firm in him, that we would look to him and we'd say, the Lord is my helper and my protector. Uh, what can man do unto me? That that would be our attitude. May God help you and encourage you. And may we continue also to pray for our beloved brothers and sisters that are persecuted around the world. Thank you for listening.